<laughs> right. the last game. Come on. Right. <laughs> Thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, everybody, for allowing me to be here. Uh, especially, uh, Greg, where are you? He puts his phone in my pocket and hooked it up to the microphone, and he goes, you're recording. Don't admit any guilt. <laughs> I'm sunk. <laughs> I don't have much to say today, then. Um, but anyway, have you ever noticed, guys, how when you set your mind to do something for the Lord, stuff happens? Yes. Sometimes, oh man, all the time. Sometimes it happens before you even get started. Sometimes it happens after. Sometimes the devil shows up. Sometimes the Lord shows up in tangible ways. Usually it's some combination of all of the above. And uh, I had that happen, actually a lot. But, but one day in Menifee, I was walking across a parking lot and I'd come from a Christian conference and um, things were happening and I, I, I was kind of just, you know, just enjoying the presence of the Lord all in my own little world and this van kind of rolled up, this dingy kind of a minivan sort of rolled up in the parking lot just as I was about to cross in to go get tacos for my daughter's cheerleading group and here comes this van and it was coming and I saw it. And I sort of like, okay, oh, they're coming this way. You know, you get that moment. Do I put my head down and just go do my thing? Or do I stop and, you know, greet, I whatever. I kind of went that route. I kind of stopped. I mean, but I had to think about it. I hesitated. And I go, okay, stop. Let them pass. And they passed, but they didn't really pass. They came over toward me. And they were looking my direction. And I, they said, excuse me, sir. And I'm like, yeah, they said, um, we were wondering if you could help us. We need a little food. Um, is there any way you could help us out? And I thought, yeah, no problem. I'm going in to get tacos. Would you like some tacos? And they said, well, we were thinking maybe like groceries because there's a grocery store right here. And I said, okay, let me go handle this. I'll come back out and we'll see what we can do. And so I did my stuff there and came back out and they had parked right by where we met. And I said, so you want to get groceries? She said, well, we, we were in a house and we got dislodged because the owner wasn't paying the rent. We got kicked out or the owner wasn't paying the mortgage or something. I don't know. One, some story like that. They, got, uh, they had to move out several days prior. And she said, I was just going to maybe get some food, maybe some beans and go to the park and cook up a little meal. And I said, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Okay. Well. Let's go get some groceries and see what we can do. And she said, well, we don't want to take up any of your time, sir. Maybe you could just hit an ATM. And, and there was a young mom, maybe 30-something, driving. Older gentleman, maybe her uncle looked like in the, in the passenger seat. And three kids in the back, teenage, a couple of girls and a boy. And didn't look like there had been a shower for a few days. And it was hot and they were sweating. They were kind of just looking off into space. And she's like, maybe just an ATM you can just we don't have to take up your time and I said well I don't, I don't know I don't care I don't have any cash and that's what she brought up the ATM I said I don't know if there's a Bank of America around here and bro talk about that blinking sign I look across the parking lot big red B of A you know right here and I said man um, there's one right right there As a matter of fact and I just spoke it out and there it was and so um, I said okay okay um, sure give me a minute and, and so I'm walking to the ATM, and so uh, I'm asking God, okay, Lord, what, what do you want me to do here? I'm, to tell me fast, because <laughs> I'm here, you know, and he told me what he thought he, or what I should do. So I got some money, and uh, I was walking back to the van, and there's something I've been working on. I don't want to just be a nice guy. Like, I kind of been trying to do that most of my life be a nice guy and be likable and that kind of thing but I know we need to give glory to God not to ourselves. and so I made a commitment in fact I had just come from a, a conference and I preached a message on uh, helping you know when Jesus told Peter after you screw up and after you come back and you're converted strengthen thy brethren strengthen your brothers do nice things help people give money give time and things like that you know and so I just just preach that and so I go, okay, I'm going to help, and I'm going to tell them where the help comes from. So I come back to the window, got my, some money in my hand, and I, I said, listen. And I reached in the window. I said, you guys know who Jesus is? And she says, oh, yeah, yeah. And the uncle looked over and goes, yes, we do. He's our Lord and Savior. And the kid's in the back. 
Say, yes, he's the reason we're okay right now. He's the only reason we're okay. And then out of the way back of this minivan, this kid pops up like a puppet. I didn't even know he was there. He's, got, he's wearing real giant glasses and he popped up and he goes, yes, he's our Lord and Savior. He goes, we were in that parking space right over there and we just prayed to him and we said, God, Jesus, will you please send us somebody that will help us? And that's when we turned on the car and that's when we saw you. And I go, wow. I mean, you can't, you can't write stuff like that, I thought. And I'm telling you that not because I did something great. I'm telling you that because I almost didn't. Mm. That's the fact of it. I was right there and I almost didn't. I almost missed the opportunity to, to be a blessing and to be used by the Lord. And when that kind of stuff happens, no one can talk you out of it. You know what just happened. They just told you that they just prayed to the Lord. And can you imagine being in heaven someday and go, let me show you this. Huh? Smart guy. I had this all set up. I had it all set up for you. A family out on the streets and you could have helped them and they prayed for someone and you walk right by and so I had to send somebody else. Oh, that would be terrible. So mm. I'm sharing that just Woo. because I think about those experiences and I realize how we need to be attuned to the voice of God. Like we need to be in prayer all the time. We need to be thinking about it. He gets the first option in, in our thoughts and our decisions. And that kind of brings me to my message today. It's a simple message, and um, it takes place on, on the mountain of God where Moses is out there, and he's tending his father-in-law's sheep, and the bush is on fire, and he has to inquire. And he goes over to check it out, and I'm going to read to you out of Exodus chapter 3, verse 7 through 10. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. And, and if you read this passage the end of chapter 2 in Exodus, the last words of that chapter say something to the effect of um, the Lord was watching and He knew it was time to act. That's one of the translations. He knew it was time. Now it's before this scene. So now it says, The Lord says, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers and I am concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians. And then fast forward a little bit to verse 10. He's talking to Moses. He says, So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And you probably know the story. Moses was... He had more excuses than a little kid at bedtime. I mean, he had excuses. Moses had excuses. God had answers. Moses asked him, I'm paraphrasing a little bit. He said, Who am I? Who am I, God? And God's answer was, it doesn't matter who you are, Moses. What's important is who I am and that I'm going to be with you. And then Moses is like, well, what if they want to know who's sending me? And God told them real simply, I am. And along, I'm, again, I'm condensing, but God said, I am sending you. He said, but I won't know what to say. God's answer said, I'll tell you. Still not convinced, we go to chapter 4. Moses asked the Lord, Suppose everyone refuses to listen to my message and no one believes that you really appeared to me. And God answered with the question of the ages, in my opinion. He said, What's that in your hand? What's that in your hand? Moses said, A walking stick. Throw it down, the Lord commanded. So Moses threw the stick on the ground. It immediately turned into a snake, and Moses jumped back. Pick it up by the tail, the Lord told him. And when Moses did this, the snake turned back into a walking stick. So that's the title of the message today. Throw it down. Mm. Throw it down. Can somebody say, throw it down? Throw it down. What's that in your hand, said the voice from the bush. And he said, it's just my walking stick. And when God said, throw it down... I don't know. I think Moses, I mean, he's got to have some issues with that, right? And he did throw it down, but he's walked this mountain for 40 years. And he cannot be comfortable with that command. Because, you know, it's not just a walking stick. It functions as a walking stick, but a rod like this, and his was probably, you know, way up here, shepherd staff, thicker, you know, with a hook and some, you know, nice little bumps and sharp edges and stuff like that. Because... It's a tool of his calling, but it's to clear the path, make sure that there's a clear path, not brush out of the way. It's to defend himself if he needs to. It can be an offensive weapon or a defensive weapon. I mean, it was protection. It was everything. 
That's what was in his hand, and that's what God told him to throw down. And I'm adding a little more drama than the Bible lets us in on, but I imagine Moses saying, God, you, you know about a lot of things, but you might not know that out here in this wilderness, well, you just don't go around throwing down your staff. After all, I mean, you never know when. Throw it down, Moses. Someone throws it down. And the stick, you know the story, immediately becomes something else. Right before his eyes. We read about it, but can you imagine? Right before his eyes. And so Moses jumps back like any right-minded person. Some translations say he began to run. And imagine, he starts to run. Moses, he hears the voice again. And the old shepherd stops in his tracks. Pick up the snake. Right. What? <laughs> and God didn't just say pick up the snake. He said pick up the snake by the tail. <laughs> like, I think God probably was smiling at this point. <laughs> because pick up the snake and then pick it up by the tail. So, I mean, Moses probably thought, like I said, God, I don't mean to object, and I, you know a lot about a lot of things, but out here in the desert, well, you just don't pick up a snake. I mean, I'd beat it with my walking stick if I had a walking stick, but you would never pick up a snake, and if you were going to pick a snake up, you would never pick it up by the tail because it, Moses! <laughs> yes, sir. And the moment Moses touches that slimy, slithery serpent, it's back into something else. And I guess the first point I want to make is obedience changes things. Amen. Obedience changes things. Moses never would have known that that could have happened or the power of God in that way if he didn't do what he was told, if he didn't throw it down and pick it up when God told him. So Moses lifts up the rod and that same rod that he would lift up in Pharaoh's court to free his people, the same rod he would lift up to divide the water and guide millions of people through a dry ocean bed with water standing up on both sides. The rod that would remind Moses that if God can turn a stick into a snake and then turn a snake back into a stick, then maybe he can do something with stiff-necked, stubborn people and their stubborn hearts. Maybe he can do something with the everyday common elements that we have in our hand. And maybe we can be an instrument in his Maybe he can do something with us, guys. What do you think? Amen. Doing something significant for God is not about our resume. And I, I just think sometimes we get a little too caught up in what we haven't done or what we have done and other people. It's not about our resume. I don't care if you have more degrees than a thermometer. I don't care if you have more money than you know what to do with. It doesn't matter if you're from Yale or you're from jail. If you're from a park place or a park bench, you're accomplishments are not a deciding factor when it comes to being used by God. It's about your heart. It's about your availability. So your achievements, however noble, however shadowy they might be, they're not the concern. The key question isn't how strong are you, it's how strong and capable is Almighty God. If we read further, we can see that God didn't spend a lot of time convincing Moses of how good he was. He didn't. What he did spend some time doing was a few miracles, a few more things to show Moses his power, God's power, not Moses. God can use who he wants, when he wants. And I look at Moses back then, why him? Why then? I mean, the dude's 80 years old. Octogenarian, for some of you wordsmiths. Now, if you or I had looked, I don't know, how. I, if I had looked at Moses back in Egypt 40 years earlier, that's when I would have chosen him. He was a stud, man. He was a fiery prince raised in the palace. He had a heart for justice. You know, he didn't like to see a Hebrew slave to be, being abused. He um, trained. He was trained by the ablest soldiers. He was educated. He was part of Pharaoh's inner circle. I would have said, that dude, that's your man, Lord. He's the one. He's ready for battle. He's ready for the job. So Moses at 40, we like but Moses at 80? No way. Too old. Not relevant. Smells like sheep. <laughs> Speaks a foreign language. I mean, what could he possibly have 
on Pharaoh. He is definitely the wrong man for the job. And Moses, I'm pretty sure, agreed based on his behavior. He probably think those people don't want to be, they don't want to be helped. Just leave me here to tend my sheep. They're easier to lead anyway. You wouldn't have sent him, I don't think. I wouldn't have sent him, but God did. And I'm wondering how many of us today feel the way about ourselves sometimes that Moses felt about himself. God's not done with any of us. In fact, the no man left behind, I love that name. But it doesn't just mean that we care for our brothers and sisters. I think it, it has to do with our assignment. How about this? No man left behind, every man assigned. Amen. Right? Amen. Amen. We got work to do, guys. And, and God, in his infinite wisdom, used the setbacks in Moses' life to humble him. Okay? Anybody been there? No. And he used the wilderness in Moses' life to train him for service. Nothing is wasted. All that junk we go through. So after 40 years in the palace and then 40 years in the wild, God from a bush that was on fire said, School's out, Moses. It's time to get to work. And Moses didn't even know he was enlisted. But he was. And so are you, and so am I. And that voice from the bush that calls to you, it reminds us that God knows exactly where we are. Exactly where we are. He knows exactly what's going on. He's been watching everything. And he, he's concerned about people who are suffering. And he isn't finished with you. Oh, you might think he is. I know, some retirement age guys in here right. might think they're on the downhill side and maybe it's these young up and coming you know fiery young ministers pastors Christians sometimes men will take a step back and there are times and places to do that but make no mistake you're not done till you're done yeah. Amen. You, you might think you're past your prime or God's got someone else to do the job but think again and I think that's my message today. I mean, we say, who am I? But uh, how will I? I'm, I'm not like, what if they say? And I mean, all I've got in the world is this, and it ain't much like Moses, or like, like most of us. Moses didn't understand the value of what he had. He didn't understand the value of what was in his hands until revelation came from God, and God said, throw it down. Throw it down. And this rod... It was something that, you know, it was nothing special by itself, obviously, just a <laughs> stick. But the two things that made it special it was what he had and it was what he did with it. And another point I wanted to make is God didn't ask Moses what he didn't have. And we all can make a long list of what we don't have while we're not equipped, right? I mean, Lord, I don't have enough. Have you ever said that? Mm -hmm, yeah. I've said it. I say it. I probably say it way too often. God, I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough credentials. I don't have enough Bible knowledge. I don't have enough training. We don't have enough social standing. We don't have the influence. The list can go on and on. But I want to direct you to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 11 through 13. I love this. It says, Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it might be matched by your completion of it. It means you want to do it, so do it according to your means according to what you have whatever that is then it says for if the willingness is there the gift is acceptable according to what one has not according to what one does not have mm -hmm. so God never directs our attention to what we don't have it's all about what you got it's like the little widow and the two mites Jesus called attention to those two mites and it was paltry it was puny it was nothing it, but she threw it down. Well, she dropped it like it was hot, all right? But she dropped it in the bucket. And Jesus took note. And he said, I've never seen this kind of faith. And it wasn't about what she didn't have because everybody else would say she didn't have nothing. He said, it's not about what she has or doesn't have. It's about her heart and the fact that she gave it up for me. Amen. Amen. The stick was what Moses had. He threw it down and he honored God in an act of scared obedience. And the shepherd's staff became the rod of God. Um, God can use anything we have and turn it into a weapon against the devil. He showed Samson the jawbone of an ass, a donkey, and he destroyed a thousand enemies with it. The victory was in the jawbone when God got a hold of it. The prosperity of the widow and her son was in the little 
pot of oil, the little bit of oil in her house once God got a hold of it. The five loaves and two fishes, once it was released into service for God, only then was it able to feed the multitudes. Amen. So the seed for what... Is that Luis? Yes. Yeah, What's yeah. up, Luis? Hey, what's up, How you doing, man? The seed for what you need is always in your hand or just within your reach. The Lord will show you your pot of oil, the jawbone of victory, the rod of deliverance, if you will just ask in Matthew 7, 7. Ask and you shall receive. Just ask. So no more excuses, no more alibis. All right, guys? Get up, go, and excel. You're not empty-handed. You're not God-forsaken. You are His treasure in earthen vessels. And God will put His super on that thing you call natural. But remember, availability is the key. He threw it down when God told him to. And isn't it amazing, as men, how often we want to pick up the very thing that God would have us throw down and release the thing that he's trying to get us to take a hold of. This is a man thing, I think, for, in particular, because so much of the time we come to faith and we say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to take charge of your life. I want you to pick some things up here and do what I've called you to do. And so we want to pick things up. And then other times we're told to surrender. And what it gets a little confusing for me in my journey. I'm like, what am, I, what am I supposed to surrender and what am I supposed to pick up? But that's why we need to be attuned to the voice of God so that you know we understand His will. Because we'd be throwing down the snake and picking up the stick. Amen? God told them to do the opposite. That relationship, huh, after what she did, after what she said, I'm done. God says, pick it up. I tried, but I just can't do it. I quit. God says, pick it up. Or the other way. I'm so sick and tired of waiting for them to get their act together. I'm just going to take control of the situation. I mean, if you want to get something done, you got to do it yourself. Grab the bull by the horns. And God says, throw it on the ground. Mm. He says, let it go. I've had everything. I've had all I can stand, and I can't stand no more. God, God, God. <laughs> <laughs> and God says, "Leave it alone. This one's mine. Throw it down." And that's why we just have to stay tuned in. Now, we don't have a burning bush, I don't think, in most days. But we do have the Bible. We do have the Word of God. We have so much content. And communication if we want it. Christian radio, TV, Holy Spirit, broadcasting network, YouTube, God Tube, podcast, blogs, no man left behind. We got Sunday sermons. We got each other where iron sharpens iron. We've got a lot that Moses didn't have. In case you didn't notice. And the Bible tells us repeatedly not to be afraid, not to be dismayed. He says, I'll uphold you. Peace be still. Don't worry. Be anxious for nothing. When you're in over your head, you're not going to go down. I'll be there with you. Why are you afraid? The Lord is with you. He says, no harm will befall you. No calamity shall come near your tent. He says, I was, I am, and I forever shall be. And I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. And the ones that are with us are greater than the ones that are against us. But we sometimes stop. Sometimes we procrastinate. Fear and trepidation leads to paralysis and procrastination. The be Here's one for you. The best way to turn a little problem into a big problem is to nurture it with a little procrastination. <laughs> and remember this, you probably heard it, but delayed obedience is still disobedience. If God's the one calling you to take a risk, there's no risk. God says, don't delay and don't worry. He says, I am, you're not. He says, I'm the one who accomplishes, you're not. I'm the one who governs, I'm the one who causes, you're not. You just need to obey and you just need to throw it down when I tell you to. Amen. And you know, it affects other people in tremendous ways. Um, it might be a simple thing, throwing it down. It might be just obeying his voice in small daily experiences. I had a situation in our office a couple years ago and I, I have a business and we have a website and e-commerce and that kind of thing and I ended up uh, connecting with a company in India to do our our online work and it was kind of an odd experience you know the 12 and a half hours time difference and eventually they they assigned me a guy and that was who I usually talk to a couple times a week and he was a nice guy I didn't know him very well but over a course of several weeks I was getting to know him and one day he sounded so down his name's Himanchu by the way but I just shortened it called him H-man 
because it was easier. But one day I said, um, are you, is everything okay? Because I just sensed this heaviness, right? And he says, no. I go, it's not? He says, no, terrible, very bad. I'm like, well, okay, um, is there anything we can do? No, it's just terrible. I said, okay, well, we'll, we'll pray for you. I got him on speaker, there's a few guys in the office. He says, what? I said, we'll pray for you. That's what we do around here. He says, but I don't believe. I say, you don't believe? I am atheist. I go, you're an atheist? He said, yeah. I go, then there's no hope for you. And shame on me, because there's always hope, because God's arm is not short. He can reach all his kids. But I said, there's no hope for you. He said, what? I said, if you don't believe, I said, oh, no, no, wait, wait. One of those moments again, right? Throw it down. I said, we're going to pray for you anyway. He says, okay. So we prayed, and that was the end of it. And then a few weeks later, I got an email from him, and he said, hey, if you really believe in a higher power, please pray for my fiance's father, because he's been diagnosed with an illness, and the family's, you know, in shock. And I said, okay, you got it. We're praying. And I'm like, yes, God's going to heal him. Watch this. All right, watch this, devil. This guy's going to get healed. Man, I love how God works. And about two weeks later, I got a note from him that said, my father-in-law died. I said, oh, God, what was that? A perfect opportunity, you know, uh, the way I felt. And so I felt bad, but over the course of time, just kind of kept doing business and, and kept trying to plant seeds here and there, just occasional verse, occasional mention, witness. And um, one day out of the blue, he said, hey, I need to catch up on some reading. And I was wondering which Bible I should buy. And I'm like, you were? Okay. So we're online doing Skype and I'm going on different websites to try to, he picked out this Bible because it was really cheap and it was an old King James with tiny, tiny writing and English isn't his first language. And I'm like, no, 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 don't get that one. But this is only so many rupees. And I'm like, no, get another one. Let's get a youth one with some pictures and some big headlines and a modern translation. And, and so I'm trying and he couldn't afford those. And I said, well, well, we'll get it for you. Let me buy it for you. But we couldn't get it to work because he was on the other side of the world and the wrong currency and internet and whatever. I couldn't. So I was kind of disappointed again, and I, I, it didn't work out that day. And I said, well, we'll, we'll figure it out. The next day, I get um, a, a note from him, and he says, um, I think I have it written down here. He says, there really is something to this Bible. There must be. Today I heard from an old friend of mine. I haven't seen him for over two years, but I once loaned him 4,000 rupees, and then he moved to Australia, and I never heard from him. And now he called me and says he wants to pay me. I asked him what made him call me. He said something would not stop bugging him in his head. And he wants to pay me today. And he says, now I can buy Bible with right. smiley face. I said, wow. God will change the world in order to save the world. He Amen. changes things. And I told him, God did that for you. He prompted you, or he prompted your friend Right? Something bugging him in his head and he had to pay you because he knows you were seeking him and he wants to talk to you. And he said, that's hard to believe. I said, what do you mean? He said, that someone actually cares for me. This, he's about 27 year old young man, very nice guy, humble heart and everything. Somebody cares for me? He was actually shocked. And it's so strange to think of how God connects us. You know, he's across the world in a different time zone. And he sends me pictures of elephants walking down the street outside of his window. And the peacock's coming in and out of his house. And he can't talk today because there's a flood and they don't have internet. And he had to walk down to the bathroom. I mean, totally different world. But God took a couple people and connected them in a way that only God could do it. And uh, I'm going to tell you just a, a, a kind of an addition to the story. Um, one day, the he sounded down again okay this is a few months later and i i said you're not depressed are you he said no no that is the old himanchu the unbeliever and i go do you believe you, wait wait oh you believe yes i do and I said, yes okay so we've been friends and we talk you know i talk to him almost every day now but back then it was still kind of sporadic and a few months later Things were tough financially, and he, 
he was just didn't know what to do. And, and so I go, man, that's okay. God, it was a financial thing. I go, you know, I told him about the disciples and how they had bills to pay and they didn't know how they were going to pay their taxes. And Jesus sent him down to the lake and he said, throw in the line and pull out a fish and, and take the coin out of the fish's mouth and you should use that to pay the taxes. And he's listening to me and I, I said, so don't worry is what I'm saying. God will do it for you. If you ask him to do it for you, he'll take care of the bills. So... A day or two later, he asked me if it was okay to share the story. And I go, please share the story. He says, oh, and I sent him a picture of a fish. Is this the mouth of a fish that had a gold coin and a guy's hand reaching in? It was like a painting. And I just kind of sent it to him afterwards just to remind him, don't give up. Don't give up faith. And so he asked me if it was okay to share the story. I go, of course it's okay. Why wouldn't you? I didn't know if it was you had rights and it was copyright. I go, it's the Bible, man. I, don't have, I go, please share the story. I said, why? He said, because I put the fish on my profile and everybody is asking me about it. And so I want to tell them the story. I go, tell them the story, please. Look in your Bible. And, you know, we talked about it. And next day he tells me, they're calling me Lucky Charm. <laughs> I go, what do you mean they're calling you Lucky Charm? He said, well, he works nights because his clients are here and it's daytime here. So he goes to bed when his parents are going to work. And his parents and his now new wife were there at breakfast right before his bedtime. And he told them the story about how God could pay the bill from the mouth of a fish and, and they should have faith. And, you know, they believe all kinds of stuff over there. And so he said, you wouldn't believe it. I said, try me. <laughs> they came home that day and he said, my mom brought sweets. Sweets. I go, what's sweets? He goes, like pastries and stuff. She brought them. I go, okay, why? He says, she got the increment. I go, what increment? He said, that's their term for a raise. She got a raise that day. And wasn't even in line for a raise, but they gave her a raise. I go, did she get those often? No, no, many years. And so she got a raise. And then his dad came home. He said, he had sweets. I go, what? He had sweets? What for? He got the increment too at his company. Two different jobs, two different companies. He got a raise. This is the same morning he told them about how Jesus could take care of them. And then his fiance came home and she had gotten some big contract and he was floored. And I'm not saying God's a slot machine or any of that kind of thing. I'm just saying he's amazing. And so now he's got the fish on his thing and they call him Lucky Charm and he's now saying, it's not me. You go like this. And so, um, Lucky Charm. I got a note from him Easter Sunday. I was in church, and here's what it said. Wishing you and all your loved ones a very happy Easter. May the risen Christ bring you and your family abundant happiness. Have a blessed Easter. Wow. Amen. Wow. Amazing, isn't it? A couple of stats before I close. 22 of our military veterans commit suicide on a daily basis. Each day in our nation, there are an average of 5,240 attempts of suicide by young people grades 7 through 12. The U.S. loses an average between four and seven children every day to child abuse and neglect. There's one report of child abuse every 10 seconds. 23.5 million Americans are addicted to alcohol and drugs, and that's approximately one in every 10 Americans over the age of 12, but only 11% of those with an addiction receive proper treatment. I have backup for all these stats if you want to know where I got them. 41% of first marriages end in divorce, around 60% of second marriages end in divorce, and one statistic says that almost 73% of third marriages end in divorce. Islam is widely considered the fastest growing religion on earth. Abortions worldwide, 125,000 a day, 3,000 a day in the US, that's one every two minutes around the clock. There's an extremely severe cyclone a week ago that was targeting India. 800,000 people had to be evacuated. Now, I don't mean to be negative. I'm not negative. God is a good God. He is a good, good Father. Amen. And we know it. But the problem is not everyone does. And there are so many people walking around this earth. They cannot believe that God could ever forgive them for the mess that they made. No, we know different, right? Amen. We have work to do, guys. Most importantly, every day thousands die without knowing Jesus Christ and without eternity in heaven. And that's what it's all about. Amen. I'm just so honored to be here with you guys today. You're walking it out. Iron does sharpen iron. You're affecting this community, this valley, and this world. Don't stop. God's going to come up to you anytime, probably repeatedly, and He's going to ask you, what's that in your hand? What do you have? What do you have? Think about it. What do you have in your hand? 
throw it down. Amen. And when you do, it's going to change the whole trajectory of your life and probably that of others. God's power through your obedience changes things. And He'll change the world in order to save the world, but He'll do it through your obedience. And He's tireless and He's relentless and He's faithful and He's watching everything that's happening down here. And I'm going to finish with the verse I started with where the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people. I have heard them crying out. I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them. So now go. I am sending you. Amen. Amen. So when He calls... What are you going to do? Three words. Throw it, Throw it down. One more time. Throw it down. Love you guys. God bless you. Amen.